You're listening to the When Life Hands You Lennon's podcast. But in an entry-level film production, it's one strike and you're out. You're fired. I'm not calling you back. If your goal today is to make a basket, we're going to make that basket. The minute you create something, as soon as it's made tangible, you have a copyright in it. How do I get our guys to sound that big, you know, that full when they do the harmonies? And I'm your host, Lennon Seahawk. Let's get to the show. So I'm Brooks. Um, I am a DJ producer. Started making music when I was like 14 or 15. Just started as a hobby, just like everyone. And then uh, it got kind of serious at like 17, 18. Uh, that's where, when I both got signed to like uh, a management. And uh, I started um, studying sound design. And both of those ways, like pretty much complemented each other because because of my management, I could like get more assignments in sound design. And because of my school, I got better at it. So I just kept on growing from there. And eventually I decided it was time to like release my own music, release my own project, decided to go with Brooks and release my first tracks as Brooks quite a while ago, actually, but it only like, I really started focusing on it about three or four years ago. And I released a couple of tracks on Future's Music, four or five tracks, I think. And pretty much all of them got played by like a lot of big names. And that's how I got in touch with Morning Garrix and eventually with David Guetta. Um, made music with Shozak, Bass Checkers, Mark Williams. And now we're here. So, <laughs> yeah, you've, you've had kind of an interesting ride. You've kind of rose to fame, you know, in a couple of years, but you, you rose to fame very, very quickly. Um, so how, do, how did you kind of handle that quick success and all these people kind of reaching out and management and big artists? And how did, how did all that kind of come about? Other thing is a lot of people ask me that, yeah, pretty much the same question. Like they're, they're wondering how you can grow that fast and, and how, how can you work with all those big names that fast? But what they don't realize is that the, that I've been like producing as a full-time job since I was like 17 or something. And the management that signed me at 17 was actually Showtex management. Okay. So it was really easy for me to, to get in, um, in the studio with them and like use their studios to work on in them because they were on tour like all the time, a couple of years back. And they had these crazy studios back in my, where, yeah, where I live. And they let me use that. And I, I would just spend like 20 hours a day in the studio, like making music, uh, pretty much any genre uh, actually. And so I like discover my own own sound. And what people think is that like my career like started three years ago and it, it got where it's at in those three years, but started way earlier than that. And I think a lot of people don't understand that it takes so many years like of practice and then once you start, you know, getting attention, then you start being recognized and then people think like you just started like last year. Well, in your case, like you said, it's that's not the case. You know, you had been producing for years prior to that and you just started kind of rediscovering your sound. So kind of going into the into the sound and kind of discovering your sound, like you talked about all these different genres and how did you kind of navigate through all these different genres until you kind of settled on something that you're like, this is definitely the Brooks sound. Um. Well, the thing is, I, I just like making music in general because uh, when I started uh, my study as a uh, sound engineer, my main goal wasn't really to become like a, a big DJ or something because I was all I also had like assignments to make music for movies or for commercials or, or for video games. And that was just pretty much what I wanted to do, like design sounds, pretty much be the, the nerd of the in the studio, you know, like twist all the knobs and know exactly what they do and stuff. And yeah, that, that it just, it was a hobby at first, but it just kept on growing and growing. And I, I, I learned a lot more with tricks. And then while I was doing the, the study, I met like a lot of uh, other musicians as well. So uh, a lot of them were like Dutch rappers where I made beats for, and I made like trends and hardstyle. I actually started out with hardstyle. <laughs> Interesting. So I, I've made like a lot of different sounds and, and, and with every, Every single style you make, you find something that you like, this small little trick that you discover. And over the years, you, you get so many of those small little tricks that, that you found out by yourself and you only you do. And if you combine all those little tricks, 
that's pretty much where you develop your own sound. It just happens over the years, I think. Because okay. there's a lot of people that ask me, uh, like, for example, after Masterclass or, like, in, in my DM or, like, uh, when they send me demos, pretty much the main thing is how they, they ask is, how did you get your sound and how can I get mine? And they're, like, people, they're, like, producing for half a year and they already expect to have their own sound and and be at the top you know so a lot of people don't realize it takes years for that to develop and during during those last couple of years and many years that you were producing and practicing and trying different styles and genres can you can you talk about some of the the struggles that you had during those times whether it be maybe you thought you would never make it or maybe it was something like oh i hate this sound i'm never going to come up with this sound can you talk about those different types of things that you kind of struggled with as you were coming up? Yeah, well, obviously there's like, um, you always have your own music that you really like and, and music that you don't like that much, you know? And while I was uh, doing those studies, we had to make music in every genre and, and especially the genres that I, I didn't really feel that much at that time, for example. It was really hard to, to get into because you want to make something cool for for the, the one that's asking or for an assignment or something, but you much rather make like a different sound or a different style. So it could be like a struggle and it almost started to, to feel like homework. It actually was homework, so don't get me wrong. But yeah, I, I don't know. It's 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 just cool to, to make your own sound, but it's challenging to make a cool track of something you, you're not really into yourself just do what, what you're told and, and have like a couple of lines of people telling you how it should sound and g they get they give like a couple of reference tracks and that's all you get. But then again, I feel like that's where you learn the most from because I, I one of my assignments, for example, in my first year um, was to like team up with a band and record all of their instruments and, and mix it together and add some synthesizers and stuff. and. Back then, I was like 17. I wanted to make my own music and make my own style. I didn't really like that. But a couple of years later, I noticed that the styles that I didn't like to make or the stuff that I didn't like to do, that's where I learned the most from. Because now every time I'm in the studio for like a writing session or something, I'm, it's like super easy to work with each other because I know how to do it. Because I've met a lot of people who just are like EDM producers and I feel like I have like kind of an advantage of, of while, I'm be, while I'm in the studio with the other artists because I've pretty much made every single sound out there and it's just much easier to work together if you know exactly what what they mean and what kind of sound they want to achieve instead of only like the 128 BPM kind of stuff. And so you, you learned a lot of skills outside of just you know, producing music, you learn how to work with people, you learn how to record bands and mix them together. Can you can you elaborate a little bit how it's important to kind of keep those open minds when you're working in the studio or when you're when you're trying to find your sound and as you're kind of coming up or performing, whatever? Well, I, I think the first one is what, what I told earlier is that you, you discover a lot of stuff that you didn't even know about because that's some stuff you you never touch while making the music you want to make. Like for example, when I was making beats for rappers, they had like all these crazy crazy ideas that I never even thought of. And when I made the tracks with them, then later on that night when they were like going home and stuff, and I wanted to work a bit more on my own music, I noticed that I could implement so much of that stuff that we just did, like all the new samples we made, all the new sounds we made, and it worked so well to implement that in my own tracks and it was like something new as well. And that's another element to add to, to the Brook sound, you know, and it's the same with bands. Like, uh, like I said, if I'm, if I have a writing session with like, uh, someone that's here to record a, a guitar riff or a, a vocalist or something, it's just super easy to switch styles. And if they, if they get inspired and in like a totally different BPM, a totally different sound, I can just switch to that and might be the, next biggest thing you know you never know yeah absolutely so keeping an open mind and and really learning all the techniques that you can from anybody and everybody you know you never know what you're going to incorporate into your sound you know and i think that's that's one of the things that a lot of people and that i read about and producers djs whomever songwriters that they, they struggle with is it was really kind of discovering themselves but 
they don't really seek out and really kind of draw inspiration from anybody and working with somebody else or working from with a rock artist or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. I, I still do that. And the thing is, um, it might not be something that that I I release as myself, but it just feels like some time off from like the the daily grind to of like flying flying to the next show and and work on your next EDM track on your hotel room and stuff. And it's not that I don't like that, but I I get so much inspiration while I'm working on those tracks because I do the other stuff as well. And it's still, so I still keep it fresh, you know, to, to make like the Brook sound because I've been making other kinds of music that for the last couple of days. So now I re I'm really excited to make that Brook sound again. So it and, doesn't really like, feel like a chore anymore. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you've got such a unique sound and it's very melodic and it's very, very powerful. Um, so when, when you're trying to um, kind of grow and learn from these artists that you're working with, are you, are you kind of afraid that you're going to change your sound too much and then people aren't going to like it? Or how, what's your mindset on that? Well, that's, that's kind of hard. Cause of course, the people that, that are following me now, they really want to hear that Brooke sound. So it's really... Even though I sometimes I really want to like make something completely different, I I just know that not everyone is gonna accept that, and that, that's something I, I I try to work towards like switching to new sounds all the time, and and you got you got to stay relevant, you know. You, you can I can release the, the same tracks for the next six years, and like the the fan base I have now will probably be happy, but I feel like it's it's a lot better, and it's very possible to like slow slowly transition to other sounds as well. And that's something I want to do as an artist as well, like just keep improving myself and, and have everyone grow with me with that sound, you know? It's, I don't know. It just feels a lot better. Yeah. And you've always got to stay true to yourself because if you're not enjoying the music you're writing, then it's, it's is there really any point? Yeah. So. But the, the thing is, like, um, like when I first started to, like, to gain some attention, that's when I noticed that, I was really struggling to make music because I was like really focusing on what they liked in my previous tracks. And I noticed like, even though I didn't want to, I was recreating the same track over and over again. And now that I'm like, all right, I know they, they want that sound, but I, I have hundred percent. I trust them hundred percent to accept the new music, the new sounds and that kind of stuff. And the moment I, I realized that and accepted that the workflow in the studio has been so much better as well so i feel like it, it works better in both ways like i make new stuff i feel, feel good about my music and the people that listen to it get like a new sound as well and they're, they're like surprised that it, it, it's like a new track again something different and it's a win-win i feel like mm -hmm. yeah so congratulations on that that's something that a lot of people have a struggle with and it sounds like you've kind of mastered that transition so yeah i appreciate it thank you yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, so, you're the publicist had mentioned that you're kind of a, an introvert, and a lot of people are. I'm an introvert, um, and you're in such an industry that is so taxing and demanding of your time and and communication on so many people. So, how how do you kind of fit in with that? Like, how do you work with that? Because I know a lot of people struggle with being an introvert. Like, oh, I I can do music, but I'm not ready to perform or communicate with these types of people. Right. Yeah. Well, the thing is that that takes time, you know, like the first couple of shows I had as Brooks, I, I barely touched the mic. I, I just didn't do it. And if I didn't touch the mic in like the first minute, then I wouldn't touch the mic for the rest of the show. Cause I felt like I had my opportunity. I didn't take it. And now it's better. I, somehow I, I just talked myself into believing that, was better to not touch the mic at all and to, to do it once or twice and, and, and fail at it and just not sound confident and stuff. Because the reason I got into music was because I was like sitting in my bed, bedroom the whole night in the dark room with my laptop on my desk, just making music, making beats and, and just me by myself. And then all of a sudden you're like in front of thousands of people that want to hear tracks and want to see you perform. And of course it's scary. And that's something everyone has to get used to. I think I don't think there's anyone that has his first show and completely kills it and, and looks super confident and just super impressive and stuff. Everyone has to grow into that, I feel like, especially, like you said, the DJs that are like, most of them are um, 
Beca- they, most of them became a DJ because they 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 love the producing part of it, and then all of a sudden, the producing part is going so well that all of a sudden you get shows and you have to perform in front of people. And yeah, that's definitely something I struggle with. But yeah, like I said, it, it it gets better and better. Like I've done so many shows now, and pretty much do like a couple of shows every week. Just got back from America the, the week before, two weeks before that, did like an Asia tour, a couple of shows in Sweden and Norway, and before that in the States again. So pretty much on the road all the time. And yeah, it's it, it gets kind of rough being on, on the road all the time. But then again, you meet so many like-minded people and they're all like w- there with you because of the music. Like even if it's, of course, that's, uh, it's hard to like sit in, in a plane six hours and six hours a day. But you know, the moment you land and you get to the club or the venue, all the people there are there because they they like the music and and they want to hear you play and that kind of stuff. So should be fine, you know. Like no, it's especially uh, like yeah. I just tell myself it's it's kind of a mindset. Just enjoy the moment, realize what you're doing, and make the most of it because it's something special I get to do, and I know that not a lot of people get to do what I do. So I don't really feel like I should be scared or like don't have the confidence to do it because there's, there's people in the crowd that are there for me, you know, and, and they know all my tracks. And for example, when I start with an intro, that's like better way of going or like I do then everyone gets excited and they know all the tracks and, and they sing, sing along like every single word. So that gives you a lot of energy as well. And a lot of confidence as well. Like sometimes you get nervous before you go up, but then when you start the intro and they heard like, the first words of the track that you made and they're already singing it along like the whole crowd then it just fades away like i'm not nervous anymore i i have the confidence to grab the mic and yeah it's it, it yeah like i said it just takes a couple of years to get used to like a couple of shows and some people are better at it than others like i know people that didn't care about it at all after five shows and they were cool with it and they killed every single show like they're like born performers and there's other people who take a lot longer because they have to build up their confidence. And I was one of those people, but all works out in the end and no one blames you for not being like a superstar DJ, your first show. So, and I, I can imagine that the, this, the, you know, you're coming out on stage and, and people are singing your music and like that, that feeling probably never gets old, you know, like you, it just, you just feed off that energy after that. And I can imagine that it just, fuels the whole show yeah it's especially on tour with like uh, all the different time zones and the jet lags and and uh, like i said the the asia tour i had last week or two weeks ago mm-hmm. i spent 52 hours in a plane in six days and i had uh six shows and three of the shows were in different countries and i have i wasn't longer in that country for like five or six six hours or something they just picked me up at the airport i did the show straight back to the airport and to the next country. And although that, that kind of sucks and I really want to see like the countries and, and meet people and meet fans and it just sucks that sometimes you just have to like keep going, keep going, keep going, even though you're super tired. But like you said, then most of the time when I get back to the airport and people like the promoter or like the, the stage manager or something, you just text them with them and they send you some videos and then you can actually see how many people are in the crowd and how much they enjoyed it. And yeah, like you said, how many people are like singing along and, and that's pretty much what you do it for because that's that, that exact thing makes me not care anymore that I have another six, seven, eight hour flight coming up. You're, you're traveling so much and you're meeting so many people. How, how do you kind of manage your time and keep yourself sane and, and, and healthy amongst all this? Cause I'm sure it's very taxing on yourself. Yeah, definitely. Like, um, I pretty much do the opposite because a lot of people, a lot of DJs will probably tell you that they try to like keep super healthy on tour and when they get back home, then they can like have some cheap meals and stuff. Most of the times I um, eat what I can get on the road, like something simple, something easy, so you don't like spend too much time on it. And then when I get back home, I just cook a lot. I love it. And just buy some fresh ingredients and like take care of myself and, and like try to get back in a normal sleeping schedule and stuff. So 
when I get back on the road again, I'm like fully charged up again to to go for another couple of weeks. So that's like a big part of it, I feel like. And now that the shows are like getting bigger and stuff, it's actually possible for me to to um, fly a tour manager with me and a videographer. And the cool part is, like uh, I mentioned, like the the first couple of tracks that I released on FHM, right, on Future Music. Mm -hmm. um, the owner of that label is actually my tour manager now. So we've been friends for like since my first release, which was like three, four, maybe maybe five. I don't know. Yeah, so like years back, and he's on tour with me now. So he, I saw his label grow. He saw my career grow. Pretty much best friends, and he, he's always with me now. Plus, I have the videographer, and the first show I ever had, not even as Brooks, just as a DJ, um, was his first job filming as a paid job. And that's where we met, and I've pretty much taken him in to any show I could take him, and now we're at the level where I just, I can just take him every show, and he joined me on the America tour uh, last week. He's flying to Ibiza with me this Friday, and then another show in Belgium on Saturday. He's joining, so it's like a lot easier when you're traveling with two friends. You know, like even if if I'm tired, they can just like the two manager, my two manager can do the sound check, or uh, if there's an interview, my my two manager can just like explain them that. I have to really have to catch some sleep before the show, and if it's possible to do the interview after the the set, you know, and and th those are all small things, but they really add up. Absolutely, you know, I can imagine like traveling with friends; it makes it all a little more easier. You know, you trust them. You 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 know, you have connections and and similar things that you guys can talk about. Um, you just bring a little bit of home with you. Absolutely, and I that would probably make the whole tour process and traveling on a plane for fifty two hours a week would make it way more easier. Definitely. Uh, so going back just a little bit, you mentioned how when you get home, you like to cook a lot. Do you have like a go-to dish that you like to cook or that's your favorite meal? Um, well, uh, yesterday a couple of friends came over and I made like this um, this salmon, with, like, some, some kind of pastry and had like this salad with like grilled shrimps on it and, and lime. And because it's, it's kind of hot here in Holland and when it gets hot, it's just annoying how it gets like really sticky and sweaty and so i really wanted like a light dish like something uh fresh salad and maybe some fish and stuff so that was perfect and all my friends were like yeah i i i want that too so i just made it for everyone and i surprised myself how good it was actually it was really really good all my friends liked it and we finished all of it so actually made a deal for next week to make it again. <laughs> there you go. It, it, I when I know when I cook for friends, I get a little nervous because I'm afraid that nobody's going to like it. Or Do you have that fear a little bit too? I, I feel like that's the same thing we just talked about, right? It, it's the the fear of like messing up because of like the introvert kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. like you're scared to like, yeah, not live up to the expectation or like disappoint or something. And then the more you do it, the easier it gets. Mm -hmm. It's the same with food, I think. Yeah, I think so. Um, so you, you also mentioned, or I read that you are also pretty nocturnal. Like you like to work in the evenings and then you sleep during the day. Um, and that's that's kind of like atypical, I guess you could say. Like not many people like associate that. Like why do you choose to do that? Or is it just what you've always done? Um, it isn't really what I've always done. But the busier it got, and the more people like started texting me, calling me, needed me for, for everything. And of course, like the bigger you get, the more people that you didn't even talk to for like 10 years are all like hitting you up and calling you. And whenever I get back home and it's not like I, I sleep every day and I work every night, it, it's just whenever I really want to like make hours in the studio, most of the time I do it at night because for one, uh, the studio is next to my management's office. So if I'm here during the day, then people just walk in every five minutes. I'm like really trying to focus in on, on the track and they walk in like, hey, we have an interview here and hey, you have to do this this article and hey, this this brand wants to, to give you a sample and it just keeps on going and it really gets you out of your focus. So I just started um, to get really tired of that because every time I had, for example, I had a remix with a deadline of four days and I tried to make it like uh, during the day for the first two days 
and I just nothing happened and no inspiration and I, I, I couldn't get the track finished got kind of stressed like I have only two days left what do I do now and then I decided to just keep on going through the night and it just clicked and I had like a, a full track within four or five hours and then I had the, the next day to just completely finish it and I think that was because no one like interrupted me during um during the session you know I was just fully focused for a couple of hours um made the track could just keep working do my own thing without someone interrupting me and of course like don't get me wrong my management is great like everyone that works are like good friends of mine as well and and I love them but it doesn't matter who it is like even my mom if I'm working on my music I just like to like be left alone and that kept getting harder and harder like the more success you gain and then for a second, yeah, like I said, there's just a lot of people that, of course, they all mean like really well, but they're just like a hundred people texting you or calling you like, hey, I heard you're in town. I, I saw on your site that you didn't have shows or you're back home and you want to get some drinks or whatever. Then they're also calling and texting. And it's pretty much the same reason that it's it just gets like, wouldn't say annoying, but it's it's hard because I do feel bad if I don't reply to them because of course there have always been like good friends and and family that is genuinely really happy for me for everything that's happening and I I'm not going to be that guy that is not going to reply to them so I do reply to them during the day or like during dinner or whatever but then if I'm in studio at night they're all sleeping because they have like a normal rhythm like normal jobs they have to get to to the next morning so they're all sleeping so it's pretty much right now, like the time it's 3 a.m. here now. <laughs> so it, it, it just works a lot better for me just so I can keep focusing on music and that's it. So it was just kind of your way of like naturally kind of turning everybody off and, and just pretty much yeah, just, just shut the world off. And, and all, all I know for this night is like the studio. And that's what works best for me. And no one's going to interrupt me for the next at least seven hours. So. It's perfect. Wow. And so, and the evenings are always, I've always found the evenings very peaceful because it's just the city's quiet. Everybody's asleep. You know, you can just hear the, the crickets or you can hear the, the wildlife or the wind. Or the That's, right. weather. That's actually what I do a lot, like on tour as well, just to like clear my head a bit. There's a lot of times you have like, uh, you just land it maybe like 8 p.m. or something. Then you have dinner like really fast and you have to play your show. And then you get back to your hotel and they have like a couple of hours of sleep and they have to get, get your flight again. But a lot of times I just walk around the city for like an hour. Like you said, it's like quiet and the city's empty and just put on some like some some chill music on and just walk around for a bit. And that really like helps me clear my head and get ready for the next show. Even if that means like getting one hour less sleep or something. Um, what are some other things that you do, like even like during the evenings that you do to kind of unwind if you're not, if you have maybe a, an off day or you have kind of a week off, what are some other things that you do other than like cooking and going for a walk in the, the evenings and out in nature? Are there anything else that you do to kind of ease your mind? Um, yeah, I just, uh, well, that's like pretty standard answer, but like uh, for one, I just really like to chill with, with like close friends that, that I grew up with and I know for years and they don't treat me any differently. So, or any different. And so every time we hang out or we like go out into the city to get a beer or something like that, it's just like the old days, you know, like it, nothing changed that of course they're happy for me, but they don't really care. They just want me to be there because they know me from like day one. And we're having the same amount of fun like the that we uh, used to have. So it's always good to to do that because they still go out like almost every weekend and they have like birthdays together. And a lot of them I, I can't be with because I have to like do shows on the other side of the world and I'm literally not even in the same time zone and stuff. So it gets hard to like keep in touch with them, but that's how I catch up. And I just love, and that's also a way of recharging as well just to like meet up with friends and for the second i um don't know if it was a smart decision but i bought a playstation last year <laughs> and i got like a couple of games on that and like like i said all of the all of those old friends have like headsets and playstations as well so if we're not hanging out 
in real life than we're uh, on these headphones on PlayStation and all like making fun of each other and like even if, even if we're in, in the state team, just throw a grenade or something that that kind of stuff. So it's always fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that's on. That's always fun to do that. Um, and so, like being nocturnal, and how has that kind of affected your career outside of you know just the typical like management coming coming in and bothering you? You have this to do, you have that to do. How have you noticed your career differently than maybe a really good friend, like DJ friend of yours or producer friend of yours? Yeah, it, it's hard because um, a lot of DJs, um, for example, if you want to collab, then it's best to just hang out in the studio together. And sometimes for me, it's really hard to like get back into a normal schedule because. Yeah, for the, the, all the time zones, time zones you visit, it's pretty much impossible anyway. So I don't know how they do it, but somehow they, they do keep like a normal time schedule. So like they're up during the day, sleep during the night. And for me, it works a lot better, like I said, to, to work at night. And pretty much 90% of them want to work during the day. And that's fine. But that's something I, I really ha- have to, have to get used to again, to, to work during the day. And it, it will work, but... I don't know. I I just can't get the the same focus and and the, the mentality to as to when I'm in the studio at night. And for example, I had the the track that I made with Mike Mike Williams. He's one of those guys that has like a super strict schedule that like wakes up in the morning, goes to sleep at night, just so he he's fit and healthy, gets some sun, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And for me, it was pretty much the. the exact opposite because i was still getting used to touring and i was super jet like every time and i pretty much just gave up on trying to fix that because every time i got back got jet lag i tried to like fix my sleeping schedule then the next day i just fly to another time zone again so it would just be messed up again so i just made the deal with myself okay i'm just gonna sleep when i'm tired and most of the times that was like in the middle of the day so i just went to bed and woke up at like 11 or something and then went to the studio but yeah, so then when uh, I had like appointments with Mike, um, for example, 10 a.m. or something, it's a super normal time. And for me, that's like the complete opposite. And when whenever we would meet in the studio, I'd be so tired mm-hmm. and I didn't want to show it because I, I, I was really excited to, to work on tracks with him. And then we're still like good friends. We celebrated like my birthday together in Tokyo and all the crazy stuff. And actually, uh, we're going to meet up in the studio again. Uh, this week or next week and so I, I i just felt really bad that i i couldn't focus that well and that's exactly when i told him like okay i'm just going to be honest with you we're going to make a cool track and it's going to be fun and it's good to see you again but i'm super super tired and then he was like oh yeah no worries and and they all understand because they know how rough it can be like that's a, that's a good thing about uh in, being in the city with other djs dj producers that they know exactly yeah they pretty much live the same life as you do so you don't have to ex- explain them like sometimes i have like uh, friends of mine that work like regular jobs that just don't get how i can sleep during the day and they get annoyed by it because sometimes they have like a day over or something and they want to meet up or like go, go to a park or like see a movie or go to some club or stuff and i'll just be sleeping and i only reply to their messages six hours later because that's when i woke up and they were like not pissed, but they're like annoyed that I didn't reply yet because they know it was too late to make those plans again. But with DJs and producers, they know exactly what's up and they, they are totally fine with it. So that's a big plus. Yeah, that, that definitely is a plus when you can surround yourself and work with people who completely understand you and, and respect your, your lifestyle and your, your choices and sleep habits and all those things. So that's, that definitely makes things a lot easier, I'm sure. Um, so taking care of yourself and, and making sure that you're healthy and happy um, is, is very, very important, especially in maintaining this kind of crazy schedule that you know, you're touring and doing all this stuff. And one of those things I'm sure would be like you had mentioned that you, you kind of oppose the, the life, the party lifestyle. Um, and, and sometimes that can be a very taxing uh, situation as well, you know, like long late nights, alcohol, potentially drugs, um, bad people, all that stuff. So what are some other things? Like, what do you mean by like, I, I oppose kind of the party lifestyle? And I know it was mentioned in an email. You didn't mention it in the in the show here. Oh, no, no worries. Um, I, th- I feel like the way I see it, if you don't enjoy the night, because the, the thing is, if you go to a show, like 
I'm probably going to the next show or like back home within a couple of hours or like within 12 hours, maybe maximum one day. But the thing is those shows, like everyone involved there has like work towards that show for like three or four months. And I feel like a lot of DJs don't realize that. And the people that, that work there, like I just come in to do the show and then I'll leave the next day. But for them, it's been like months of work and they're like super proud of it and how everything turned out and they're happy the, the crowd is filled They're happy they're having fun. They're having, happy the, yeah, the after party is going great and stuff. And you, you can just, most of the times you can just see the promoters and the stage managers just so relieved that everything went well. And they want to, the thing is, those are great people as well. Like I said, they're probably into that scene because of a lot of the music as well. So you immediately have like a good connection. And especially like uh, with my tour manager who has his own music label, my videographer who has his own dance school. So the three of us are like super into music and, and that kind of stuff. And so it's easy, super easy to link up to, to the people that are there. And they like 99% of the time, they really, really appreciate it if you just stay with them and have a beer with them. And the thing is, what, what I mean with like opposing the, the, the party lifestyle, it's not like getting hammered like every single night because then the shows are going to suffer from it. But I just feel like if I go back home to my hotel, right after the show i'm not going to be able to sleep anyway right away because of the adrenaline and all that kind of stuff and when i stay at the party then i just have a good night and it just doesn't feel like work at all like i have i've, I've probably played like a, a super cool set a lot of engagement with the crowd uh, took some photos with people had fun with the promoters and and all, all the people backstage had some drinks with them had fun and then get back home. And then the only thing that's that feels like work is like flying. I, I, that's pretty much all that's left that that isn't fun, you know? So you have like an eight hour flight, but when you land it, you know, just know you can relax and you have, you have a good mindset, good feeling about it. You're excited for tonight. Uh, the people you, you're with are excited as well. I just feel like that helps a lot to your health as well. And then that sounds weird, especially like when you're drinking and stuff, but I feel like, especially lately, like it, it can get really rough on DJs and, and if they have to perform and if they have signed to multiple agencies and a management, and there's like so many people involved right now, like labels, like when it started out, it was just me, but now there's like tens, dozens of people and they're all like involved into the music. And if I get back, get out of my uh, flight, get to the show and get straight back to the hotel by myself and take another flight, then then it's going to take its all on you, I feel like. But if you take time and enjoy yourself and actually look around and realize that, for example, you just spent your birthday in, in Tokyo together with Mike Williams, did an amazing festival together. And now we're eating some birthday cake that somehow the promoter knew that it was my birthday and he brought it up and having some drinks with them and like telling like stories about the festival and what we've uh, what we've experienced like during other shows and crazy stories and stuff it just makes it so much better to keep on traveling like when you you talked about earlier you know like when you're after the show you like to go and like talk to the promoter have a beer with them whatever and it, I can assume that's only helped your career like with connections, you know, and it makes you a very down to earth and relatable person. You're not kind of that one guy that, you know, you you put all this, they put all this work in and then you just ditch, you know, you're on to the next show. You know, you actually care. You're thankful. It shows that you care, that you were very interested in the show. And, and that, that means a lot to people. Yeah. But I, I feel like those people really do deserve the, the, the appreciation because like I said, a lot of people don't realize they just go to a party and they didn't go home and that's it for them. But they've probably worked months for, for that stuff and like booking the lineup, uh, booking all the flights, booking all the hotels, have like hospitality riders, everything like that. And they do so much for you that you really do have to appreciate because like nine out of 10 times, every, everything on my rider is there and they even more likely to have added something of their own, you know, like, some regional drink or like uh, some local food bar that's, that's the best in, in that region or something. And they brought you something from that just to show you 
something of their culture or their city and stuff. And it's just great to meet up with those people. And like I said, you all have like the same mindset anyway. So it's it's just a great time. And yeah, like you said, with the connections, of course it helps because it, it's not like I I do my bookings by myself or something, but a lot of times when I have like a cool run with a lot of shows and I stay with a lot of promoters and stuff, a lot of times they actually email my management already like, oh yeah, Brooks is a cool guy. I love them. And uh, uh, thank you for, for staying over and, and appreciate it. Appreciate and thank they're most of the time they're thanking my management that I appreciate them so much. And even though I, I, I do that just to have fun, because most of the times they when they fly, for example, to Miami Music Week, we, we can meet up again or like Amsterdam Dance Event or any show nearby. We Most of the times we just link up again and have some fun again. But at the same time, it, it works in my favor as well, because the next, maybe you, you do like a super cool club show and then someone backstage is probably there that hosts like a festival nearby that's like, I don't know, like a big uh, capacity. And then you get like introduced to those people, even though that's that's not like the intention of it. Stuff like that does happen. And of course that works in your favor because you, you probably, I've probably played like festival and clubs where I probably never would have played if I didn't stay at the shows. Absolutely. And so like you talked about, like you sometimes you get an interesting taste of the culture, like when they're adding something of their own to the rider or like what's the what's do you have a favorite thing that they added or just something that they gave you as kind of a thank you? Well, like I said, I really like cooking. So like you can score a lot of points with me by local food. <laughs> so, I, uh, for example, I had this show in uh, Bangkok uh, a while ago and. Uh, I did the show. It was really cool. Uh, once again, just uh, hung out with the promoter, uh, a super cool guy. Uh, his name is Adam. And while we were done with the show, we, we had like a couple of drinks for like about an hour. And then he, he told me like, yeah, do, do you want to like try some 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 food? And I was like, I'd love to. Like, I, I love to cook. And I told him about all the stories about it and like all the food that I tried. And then he, he took me to like some really weird back alley but it was like full of the best food scents that i've ever seen and like it was like super it was pretty much street food and a lot of promoters yeah they, i don't know why but they think that you want to eat like in fancy restaurants and stuff but they're they're gonna have pretty normal dishes there like of course they're gonna have regional dishes but not like the real real food you know so he, he took me to this, to this weird back alley and they had, they had like I think about a hundred stands with like all this food that I've never seen and like insects on sticks and that kind of stuff that and super good tasting like sandwiches that I've never seen before. And, and I don't know. I just, I, I just like the fact that he wants to share his culture with me, that he, he he's proud of it and he wants to show that to me, especially like after the show and, and you get some food together, especially it's always good. Like after, uh, after drinking to get some food and the fact that he just showed me like I, I didn't even know how to describe it it was like a, a square sandwich or something and I don't even know what ingredients were on it but it, it was amazing and apparently they only have that on that street in Bangkok and he, he couldn't even explain me what it was exactly but it, it was so good that he didn't care <laughs> so that's why he showed it to me and yeah that Stuff like that is it's what what makes touring fun. Like I have stories like this for pretty much every country or city that I've been to where I just experienced some new food or like a new culture or met new people that or like learned some some you know, some some swear words in a different language, that kind of stuff. It's always good. So yeah, it just keeps adding adding up. It's it's really good. And once again, that's another small thing that just makes touring a lot more bearable. And these things like just sounds like they keep adding up for you. And it's, you know, and that guy showing you his culture and the food just it's such a beautiful thing. I just picture him, you know, showing you around somebody who, you know, a country you've not been to or haven't been to in a long time or a city you've never been to. I can just picture him kind of smiling and he's so proud yeah, of his exactly. culture. It's the same thing we just talked about with the cooking, you know, you're like kind of nervous that you don't want to disappoint and you're like, and I, I, can, I, I saw that he felt that too, because he, he, he gave me the food and he, he knew that I probably never saw it before. 
So he was kind of nervous. Like, he really wanted me to like it. And he was, like, super proud of it to show me the food, but he was also kind of nervous. And then when I took the food and I told him it was delicious and, and if we could get some more and stuff, he was actually, like, super proud and was happy. And, and he told, like, the lady that was behind the food truck um, uh, that I just played at a show uh, nearby and that, that I'm from Europe and that he that I loved her sandwiches. And he, he gave her, like, a big tip just because of it. And we, the, the two of us, like me and Adam, like we made her day as well. And she was like super proud. And she's like telling her, her friends that were like at other stands, like he likes my food. He's from Europe. He likes my food. And this was an area that tourists normally don't really come. So it was like something special for her as well. And, and stuff like that is, is stuff that you really remember. That, yeah, that, that's, that's amazing. Um, that just, it makes me smile because you made her day. He was happy, and, and it, that's just the beautiful thing of the world, and, you know, we can all connect, and just sharing something as simple as a sandwich, and how complimenting the food you- it's, it's a sandwich, right? Like, how big of a deal is it? Not at all, but just the whole thing around it, it just makes it so special. What a beautiful thing. So, th- thank you for sharing that. So, you talked about, like, you were seeing, like, insects on a stick. What kind of insects were they, out of curiosity? Um, like, most of them that I could recognize were, like... Um, some worms and stuff and some scorpions, but it were also like insects that I didn't even want to know what they were because if I (laughs) didn't know, I probably wouldn't have tried them. (laughs) Was there, was there any insects that you did try? I I tried all of them. Uh, I just wanted to taste them. He he told me that it tasted like, it was like some local snack. Like it's the same thing we ate. We eat like uh, potato chips or something. It's just something they, they get like when they're watching uh, when they're walking by and they just want something fast to eat, they, they can get stuff like that. I don't know. I just l- like to try it. It's like if everyone's eating it there, it's not going to harm me. So and I can like go back home and tell my mom, like, mom, I ate fucking insects. Like, yeah. <laughs> so like, what are the, how do they prepare them? Did you see that? Like, do they just. Yeah, they have like the, this, uh, this big skewer. skewer, okay. And they just put them all up there. And some of them were like breaded and. Some of them had like a, some barbecue sauce on it. it. You can get as crazy as you get. They just had the insects and they, they, it's pretty much like everyday cooking. You just add ingredients, add like layers on top of it or salt and pepper. And yeah, I, I don't know what they did. It was actually really good. I, not, I don't know if that's a good thing that I like to eat insects, but yeah, they, they, they were delicious. Were they fresh or were they like killed and then like dried out? Uh, both, I think. Like, oh. I, I don't think they were that fresh. They were like plucking on the streets, but you, you could just see that others were like prepared for like days. Like they, they were glazed and, and like soaked in, in, in some kind of sauce and left in the fridge for like a day. And then they, they, they fry it up or then they like put it in an oven or something. There were like so many different ways to prepare it. I, I don't know where the insects came from. I don't think. Should have asked. <laughs> no. But, yeah, I, I don't know. It was good. Yeah, well, I'm glad you liked it. I, I just don't know if I'd be able to to eat it. Do you think you would try it? Um, I think if I had a blindfold on, I might. And I, I can't see it. Right, and then just tell you it's chicken or something. Exactly, exactly. So it's, it's kind of like I don't eat seafood just because, like, when you eat, like, crab legs, it looks like a crab leg. But when you eat a hamburger, it doesn't look like a cow. Right, yeah, yeah. So that's kind of my mentality behind it. I just like it looks like a fish. I can't eat it. I just, I just can't. Um, so what, what did, what was your favorite one? Was it the scorpion or a beetle or? Um, yeah, it was some kind of beetle. And the thing is, I'm a big fan of like barbecue sauces and stuff. And I, it's probably, it probably wasn't barbecue sauce, but it kind of had the same taste, like the, the, the consistency of it. And believe it or not, like the the insect itself actually kind of ch- tasted like chicken. So it's like chicken with barbecue sauce, like on a, on a grill. Like if you say it like that, it sounds good, right? It does. Yeah. So that, that yeah, I, I love that one. I, I like think, fire them. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that that's what they all say. Like anytime like you're like people eat alligator and they eat duck and it's like, Oh, it just tastes like chicken. Yeah, but it's it's just something that we grew up on, right? Like it's right. super normal there to eat uh, eat insects on a stick or like different animals. And back here, we like back in Europe and probably where you're from, same. Like 
we have the same kinds of meats that we grew up with. But for the same thing, there's countries where the cow is, is like a, a holy thing, you know, like you, you cannot touch it. And they just don't understand how you could eat it. It's just how they were raised or, and grew up. And yeah, so like that's... If, if the insects were normal here as well, then we would probably wouldn't even have this conversation right now. Exactly. I th- I just think that's that's the the unique thing about the world and different cultures is that it's yeah, how... it's not a big plus about traveling and touring. You you just see so many different cultures and, and foods and you name it. Yeah, I, I just think that's so cool and how, you know, some people worship the cow and we eat it and, you know, a lot of people eat insects and I, I couldn't see myself eating insects. But, you know, they like you said, they grow up with it. So they just see it as buying a bag of potato chips. Instead of buying a bag of potato chips, you go and buy a bag of beetles and put some barbecue sauce on them or scorpions or, you know, whatever your favorite flavor is. Exactly. So yeah, it's, it's that, weird how it works. Yeah, it's very weird, but I think it's so interesting as well. You know, it's so I love learning about the different cultures in the world and kind of growing my expansion and knowledge of. of yeah, exactly. And it, and it's also places. every time I, I get back home, I always like um, buy some souvenirs. And it sounds super cliche, but I, I buy souvenirs for my mom. <laughs> so she has, has like this small table with like souvenirs from all over the world, and you even see in those souvenirs that's like different cultures. Like I, I got like poker chips from Vegas and like some. Uh, some religious statues from like Thailand and that kind of stuff. And and if you see all those things next to each other, it's like super typical for each country, but they're so different. And that's the same thing with the food and, and everything else. It's just, it's fun to see. Like, and every single uh, souvenir that I see back at my, my mom's place, I just see where that's from what what city and what country most of the times i just completely remember what show it was and i can just look at one souvenir and have like 10 memories with like paired to that souvenir it's just funny how it works like it's so different everywhere yeah that that's so cool um that's so amazing so um i don't have any more questions for you i think we 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 went on a good tangent there and sharing the the beauty of the sharing different cultures and learning different things um so how how can the listeners kind of follow you and keep up with you um all right all my socials are at music by brooks um release most of my music on stem at the moment and yeah on just Trying to focus a lot more on my uh, YouTube channel as well now, so we're like making videos for that as well. I don't think there's any up now, but we're gonna work on that a lot. So keep, yeah, check out the the YouTube because it's probably gonna be master classes and, and live sets and, and just studio time that that kind of stuff and live on tour. But yeah, just at Music by Brooks and check it out if you want to. If you like it, thank you. If not, let me know why not. <laughs> I'll put all of your sh- your links in the show notes as well so people can easily access them. One thing, if you're ever in Asia, eat something you've never eaten before, okay? Okay, I will use that as a challenge and I will let you know that's a deal. Awesome. All right, cool. thanks a lot, man. Yep, have a good night. You too. I've been a big fan of Brooks for many years. I discovered him, one of the first songs that I discovered him through was his Hold It Down with Micah Martin. And then I've followed him ever since and have been a big fan of his track Bite with Martin Garrix. I love his track Boomerang, Like I Do with David Guetta and Martin Garrix. And then recently, Better When You're Gone. He's had so many major releases on Big Beat, Atlantic, What A Music, and how he got his start was with future house music. And I'm still honored to have had him on the show and had the conversation with him about him sharing the stories of traveling and the different cultures and the interesting foods that he's eating. Uh, I'm still not entirely sure that I would eat scorpion or cockroach or anything like that. Um, but he did challenge me, so I'm definitely up for that challenge when I head to Asia. Um, what, out of curiosity, what insect would you be curious to try if you were in Asia? Um, I'm curious to know, so send me a tweet with that. So, again, I'm humbled by Brooks's conversation um, the, on this episode. So if you would like to be notified about future episodes like this, 
please subscribe to my mailing list as it helps me notify you when new episodes like this are live. I would also appreciate your support on Patreon because it helps me grow the show and the money that I make through Patreon, I put it back into the show. I would also appreciate a five-star rating and or review as it helps the show be discovered by new listeners and it boosts it. So there's nothing wrong with boosting it, right? Lastly, if you or somebody you know would be a good guest for the show, there is a link below for the guest request form, so please fill it out and or send it to your friend. Have them fill it out, and I will reach out if they are a good fit for the show. Thanks again for tuning into this week's episode of When Life Hands You Lennons. I really appreciate you tuning into the show, and I'm humbled by and so thankful for Brooks's time and conversation for this episode. So we will see you next week on When Life Hands You Lennons.